Back in the spring, we took a survey on Easter when everybody was here, and we just say, if we could teach on some things in Scripture that would be beneficial to your life, what are some of those topics that the Bible would speak into your current situation? And so we've taken that, and we put together this series called You Asked For It. And so today lands us on the topic of parenting, to which all the kids would say, oof. I don't know what that means. I just know they say it all the time, right? You know what I'm saying? And as I look at the Bible and I look at scriptures, there's, there's a handful of passages that talk about parenting. And there's two words that I would kind of put, put these verses into. And if you're taking notes today, inside your own worship guide, there's an outline you can follow along. And I don't, I don't care what age your kids are. I think there's some stuff here today that would be practical for you. Because some of you are like, no, we raised our kids. We're free. We're free. <laughs> you know? Still, I mean, life might transition from disciplinarian to life coach, but I still think there's some stuff in here for you today. So the first word, when I think about all of these passages in the Bible that talk about parenting, that when I look at it, I see the word active. That biblical parenting is active. Multiple times in the book of Proverbs, it encourages parents, though parenting is difficult, being a parent is hard, but a hard part, but a very important part of parenting is discipline. Proverbs 23, 13. Don't hold back discipline from your child. I love the next part of this. Though you strike him with a rod or spank his little behind, he ain't going to die. Oh, we don't spank. It's going to scar him for life. Scripture says they don't die, you're good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Proverbs 22, 15. I'm going to use this a lot because foolishness, or put the word immaturity. Immaturity is bound up in the heart of a child. But the rod of disciplines, what removes it far from them? Proverbs 13, 24. He who withholds discipline. If I'm not active, if I don't discipline my child, it's almost like you hate them because you are setting your child up to fail. Life is going to be hard if we fail to discipline our children. But he who loves his children, like, oh, this is, boy, this is going to hurt you more than it does me. You know what I'm saying? That's a true act of love when you really discipline your children diligently. Changing diapers is hard. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. Paying for stuff is hard when they're kids. Amen. amen. Keeping your house clean. It ain't hard. It's impossible. Come on, somebody. Don't look at me like you're all spiritual. <laughs> But maybe the hardest part about parenting is how do I make my children mind without losing mine? You know what I'm saying? See what I did there? Woo! I'm a little bit old-fashioned. My kids will probably tell you I'm not cool, Dad. I know it's hard to believe, right? But I want to be a good dad. I would rather my children be grateful at 25 and 35 than to be impressed with me at 15. Discipline in parenting has to be active. And when it is, you see what the Bible promises. Like if you'll discipline, you help your child grow up. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Immaturity is bound up in the heart of a child. Like they're just growing, but it's discipline that helps them to mature. That's the part of growing. That Yes, your seven-year-old's going to act goofy and make <laughs> noises. I mean, that's just what they do. It's part of a junior high kid that has this horrible sense of humor in timing. You know what I'm saying? It's funny, but not now. She's crying. It's your mom. Leave her alone. And discipline is what helps and molds and shapes your child into maturity. And for it to work, for your child to grow up, for them to put foolishness behind them, for them to properly mature... We have to, as parents, push through the hard stuff, and discipline has to be active, and it has to be present. And that's hard to amen, because it's hard to do. Secondly, when I look at all these verses in the Bible about discipline, whether Old Testament or New Testament, I see that discipline must be balanced. It needs to be balanced. So let me, let me talk theology for you for, for just a little bit, and then I'll, I'll tie our relationship to our kids into God's relationship with us, because I think it's a beautiful model. It'll hurt your brain for a little bit, because God is fully law. He's fully just. And, it, and, and the Bible clearly says, don't take advantage of that. And I'm saying, don't, don't get, because God says, be holy as I am holy. And He is fully law, but God is also full of grace and mercy. So God applies conviction to our heart when we step out of line just a little bit. 
He, he puts his thumb on it and says, listen, listen, this is not your best version. And if you keep going down this road, I'm telling you, there's unintended consequences you can't see. I'm trying to protect you. So God puts conviction on our heart to get us to, to change. Then he extends grace to us to help us overcome that. So if God is only law, God is fully law, and if that's all he is, we're going to develop this mentality that God's just mean and he's angry and my relationship with God is based solely on I have to or I'm going to make him mad. People behave simply out of fear. Oh, don't do that or God's going to strike you with lightning. Oops, I've done it now. You've angered God. And you will get behavior modification, but you won't have Relationships. So I'm talking about God and his relationship with us, that he's fully law and fully grace. But some of you grew up in a home that was fully law and there was no grace. Dad would just, you know, dad expected perfection. And dad was a mean old ogre. And, or, or maybe it was mom. She was always on an emotional roller coaster and you had, to, you had to walk on eggshells. And you behaved properly, mainly out of fear. But now you have more resentment than you do relationships. So if God is fully law, you get behavior. If, you're, if your household, if, you, if you're just strict, and it's just, you, you will get behavior you're looking for because of rules, not out of relationship. God is also fully grace. Okay? In the American church, we love fully grace God. Because we can do whatever because his love is deep and his love is wide. And that is all true. And I'm so grateful for that because I need it. Like my past ain't so pretty. I, I need God's grace. But this theology about the fully grace and fully mercy side of God, if that's all I view about God, I'm going to tell you, it produces very immature believers who still act the same way they did before they became Christians, but they've been believers for 30 years. And so you don't ever get any spiritual maturity. You don't ever get any spiritual behavior modification because he just pop all God and he loves me and I can, I can go do what I want. But as long as, and, and, and God is gracious and God is merciful, but it doesn't produce mature believers. And then we just flop out the, don't judge me card, right? Because God is full of grace. And so when a home is absent of discipline, it produces foolish, immature children. It produces ungrateful, entitled children. They're not grateful for grace because they've never been extended. I mean, yes, they have. You've given a lot of grace because you should have pinched that one's head off a long time ago. But because there were ever no consequences, it just produces this child. The foolishness never gets rooted out of their heart. They never know consequence. So discipline has to be balanced. There has to be law. There has to be... God is fully law. We as a home, there has to be balance in our discipline, that there needs to be rules, there needs to be expectations, but then there also needs to be grace as well. Let me show this to you in, in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, 4. I put a couple of translations up here. The New King James says, fathers, don't provoke your children. The New Living says, fathers, don't be too hard on your kids. And he speaks specifically to us because dads, I think we tendency, not, not every situation. Some of y'all ladies crazy, but we're not talking about that right now, right? But I think the tendency is that, that dads, we can have some expectations. And boy! And so Paul just says, listen, your, your discipline needs to be balanced. There needs to be law. There needs to be expectation. There needs to be consequence. But there also needs to be grace. Extreme discipline. Unbalanced discipline. I would even say unbiblical discipline. Might get the behavior you seek. You'll get behavior modification. But you won't produce in the end what you're after. You'll get a lot of resentment. And no relationship. So I want to take an obscure passage out of the Old Testament. And I want the context of this verse. Okay? Not necessarily the story. Not necessarily is what's going on. And I want the context of what's going on in this moment to kind of speak to us as, as parents. Whether your kids are grown or whether you've got one in the oven. You know what I'm saying? So in your Bible, in the Old Testament, there's Job, Psalms, Proverbs. And then there's a book. Older Bibles would call it Song of Solomon. The newer translation call it Song of Songs. And it's a love story. It's, it's really more, it, it is a song, but it's more of a poetic story. Some believed it to be written by King Solomon. Some think it was written for King Solomon. But it tells the story of a couple that dates. They have a fight. They get engaged. They get married. They have a honeymoon. And it's a love story. 
In this story, there's a bride, there's a groom. There's friends of a bride that are part of this, and they show up and they encourage her sometimes. They help her sometimes look for him because they had a little fight. But there's also the bride's family makes a couple of appearances in this story. And I want to just look at two verses in Song of Solomon 8, or Song of Songs 8, where the bride's family shows up. Okay, It's predominantly older siblings, but what I want to borrow is the context of this story that the family should be a safe place. The family should be a place that protects the younger. The family should be a place of safety where where younger kids have the place to grow and learn. And then the family, predominantly the mom and dad, set some boundaries in place. They set some protections in place. They set some priorities in place. Okay, So Song of Songs, chapter 8. Since it is a song, I'm going to sing it. No, I won't. I'm just kidding. We have a little sister. Um, Yeah. I meant to cut that part out. So we have a little sister and her breasts are not yet grown. So we, what shall we do for our sister on the day that she has spoken for? Like the day she's engaged or, or the day that she's married or whatever. What, what are we going to do for her? If she is a wall, I love this, we will build towers of silver on her. Just pour it on, boys. Just give me silver. Gold's fine too. You know what I'm saying? Like we're going to build towers of silver on her. And if she is a door... We will enclose her with panels of cedar. So obviously when you read this, we have a little sister. So it's older siblings, probably brothers that are speaking in this situation. But I love the idea. I love the concept that the family is a safe place. That we have a role and a responsibility in protecting our children. In guiding them and leading them and, and, and building cedar pillars around them or building a wall around them. Okay, The family is a place of protection. If she's a wall, we're going to build towers. The point of a tower is to watch. The point of a tower is so I can see everything that's going on and I can can watch over the situation, right? If she's a door, if she wants to explore the world, if she wants to let everyone and everything in, if she wants to open her life up to anyone and anything, if she wants to potentially live a promiscuous lifestyle, how are we going to respond? We'll enclose her. We're going to build a wall around her. The context is families or parents. It's our job to watch over our children and it's our job to build a wall around our children to protect them because no one will watch over your child. No one will protect your child. No one will set priorities for your child the way that you will. God gave them to you and it's your biblical God-given responsibility to watch over and protect. Amen? I want to help us build some towers today where we can watch over our kids. And in some situations, I want to help us to build some cedar panel walls, to, to build some protections around our kids. And I just, I'm just i going to take these off for a little bit. And let, uh, This is from teachers I talk to, pastors, counselors, youth pastors, children's pastors, parents. This is what I see happening today in 2019. I don't know that these issues were present in 2009 or 1999, but I want to talk about what I see in parenting today. And I am one. Jerry and I have two kids. we got a 16-year-old and 12-year-old. And so these are some issues that I see today. And I want to let let this story out of Song of Solomon just let the context of that speak to us. Okay? We need to watch over. We need to build some walls around and and protect. But here's the balance. If you overprotect your children... You really put them in a dangerous situation. You you really do. So the first thing I want to deal with in today, we need to teach our children how to process pain. Teach our kids how to process pain. We have a generation that has never ridden in the back of a pickup truck. Come on, somebody. Like it was when I was a kid, it was hold on for dear life because we got the pastor. You know, the thing would buck you off. Oh, stop. Brent fell out again. You know. We have a generation that has never eaten dirt because they're not even outside playing it. In a minute, Dad. And they're playing Xbox or whatever. We have a generation that does not know the total and complete pain of defeat and loss. Unless they're OSU fans, then they know, right? But we have a generation that doesn't know defeat and loss because we've handed out participation trophies. You got second graders walking around with Super Bowl rings going, what's up, what's up? Have you seen my playing card? 
by my poster my mama got hanging in a room, you know. It's like, what, what, what? And one of the best things you can do for your kids is build a tower to watch over them and help your children learn how to cope with pain, anxiety, stress, fear, worry, sadness, depression, failure. Because all that stuff is real. And let's be honest, all that stuff is real hard. I'm watching, but I'm not always jumping in. I want to. Man, I, I hate to see my kids struggle. I hate to see my kids hurt. I want to send an email. I want to pick up the phone. I want to tell them how mm, you don't realize how incredibly awesome my kid is. I, I want to, but, but, but I think scripture says, hold on. Sometimes we just watch over them. So the, different, the difference between a helicopter and a tower as the tower is stationary and it just, you stay in it and you just watch, a helicopter swoops in and lands. And so the Bible says we're going to build towers, not helicopters. Not that they were a thing 3,000 years ago. But and By the way, this is one of the points of discipline. This is the discipline helps bring foolishness out of your child. It helps them grow up. This is one of the, the advantages to discipline is to help your kids learn through pain and failure. I don't learn through success very well. I just don't. When we succeed, we're like high five. All right, we did that right. Obviously, God's blessing us. <laughs> you know, but it's when we go through struggle and pain and failure that we really stop and we really evaluate ourselves and we've learned some of our hardest lessons in pain. Discipline. When you add the board of education to the seat of higher learning, you know, that pain helps to train your child. It pulls foolishness. It pulls maturity out of us. But discipline also teaches your kids how to forgive. Something our culture is not very good at. When you're seven years old, mama spanks you. And you start having that conversation in your head. Well, I'm just going to run away from home. But then 30 minutes later, you need a snack. And there's only one person that can help you with that snack. You know what I'm saying? It's mama. And so you learn how to forgive really fast. You don't like it, but I learned how to do it. Ever notice we forgive the people that we need the most? Now, I know, I know, I know. Some of you are thinking, well, I got a situation. And sure, maybe there was somebody in your life or, or part of your team or, or your job or whatever that you did need them, but their, their crime against you, their pain was so intolerable that, that I, I don't, it's not that I don't need them. I, I just can't. I can't risk letting them hurt me. I understand that's real. I, I get that. Some of you have that situation. But for the most part, we tend to forgive people that we need. It's easier to forgive them. And so kids have to learn how to forgive the parents that have been abusive and over the top and unnecessarily completely in an unfair manner taking their phone. And kids learn how to forgive. Why? Because they got friends that want them to come over and play on Friday night. Or they have cell phones they're a little bit addicted to and you start to make a deal with mom. If I clean the entire house for the next seven years, can I have my phone back? All right. Or you need some money? We learn how to forgive mom because I need mom, right? People we don't need, eh, yeah, sure, I forgive you. <laughs> I don't need you. And that's the beauty of discipline. It teaches your children how to learn through pain, but it also teaches your children the art of forgiveness. And so we need to build some walls around our kids, protect them, but we also need to teach our kids how to process pain. I love you. This is going to sting just a little bit, but that whole helicopter parenting, anytime your kid has an issue at school, you swoop in. Anytime your kid doesn't get to play, you, you swoop in. I'm just telling you. You're setting your kids up to fail. It's hard. It's true. Our love for our children makes this really hard to see in ourselves. Like when I look in the mirror, we, we, don't, we don't see that we're helicopter parents. We can clearly see it in everybody else. We, oh, amen, preacher. Like we amen that because, you know, in little Jimmy's soccer team, there's that one mom that she's extra, you know. Our little Sally's cheer team, her dad, I'm like, aw. Right? But we don't ever see that we're helicopter parenting in the mirror. We just, we just don't. And if you're curious about yourself, just ask your child's teacher. 
And if there is an awkward pause, <laughs> no, you're fine. You're guilty. We have, I don't like watching my kids struggle. I don't. And as Landon's turned 16 and been in high school and, and all the pressure that goes with that, I, I want to fix that for them. We have to watch our kids struggle and wrestle. I want to fix it. I want to blow some people up. I want that line to come out and like, you don't understand how awesome I am and my kid is. <laughs> right? But sometimes we need to sit in our watchtower. And we need to watch and not helicopter. And we need to help our kids process pain and struggle through some stress and tension and adversity and conflict. And I believe our world's missing that. I believe our world is crippling the next generation because we're protecting them from pain. So the tower watches. You call in the troops when it's necessary. There are those times. They are the exception, not the rule. But the watchtower sits and, and you watch over your children and, and you help them process pain. But then there's times that we need to build a wall. And, and here's, here's what I want to talk about those cedars and building that wall. Is, is we need to teach our kids to protect priorities. You need to build a wall around your family and your kids' priorities. Even when they're in early age, you need to ingrain these priorities in them. And I talked about this just a couple of few weeks ago. So I don't want to repeat that. But priorities serve a purpose in our life. Most of the time, they're priorities because we don't want to do them. But we know we need to. Typically, what priorities do is they have a way of pitting want to versus need to. And want to is going to win. It, it just today, 2019, America, want to is going to win. We have, a, we have a way. We have to make a priority because the want to always wins. And then we have to keep that priority on the list. I, I really, I really want to eat every bit of ice cream that I can. I really love Reese's peanut butter cups. But at 45, my metabolism has shrunk below zero. You know what I'm saying? So I have to have a priority that I'm, I'm going to take care of myself. You know, I want to spend every dollar on myself. But if I do that, she don't want to live with me. I'm selfish. My kid, you know. So it's a priority for us to be generous people. If we're not careful, we will do everything we want to do and neglect the things that we need to do. And I'm just going to tell you, everyone has a priority for your kid. Your coach has a priority for your kid. Your teacher has a priority for your kid. Your band director has a priority for your kid. Facebook has a priority for your kid. YouTube has a priority for your kid. Your phone has a priority for your kid. All of them are bidding for your children's attention. And I'm not going to tell you what your priority should be. I'm going to let you figure that out. But I would encourage you to make sure that your priorities are Christ-centered and biblically based. Then build a fence around them. Because you're going to have to fight to protect those priorities. Because here's the deal. Your kids, their friends at school, some of them may go to church. Some of them may have families that have values that are similar to yours. But there's a vast majority of them that do not. And your kids are growing up and they're watching what he gets to do, but his family doesn't go to church on Sunday morning. They get to sleep in and do all this other stuff. And, and, and so they fall into the trap that we fall into of playing the comparison game. And it's hard. It's hard to set priorities. It's hard to build a fence around those priorities. But I'm just preparing you. You need to fight for the priorities that you have set forth in your family. Listen, baby, I know, I know that Jocelyn's parents let her have a cell phone. But honey... Jocelyn's in the first grade and so are you. You don't really need a cell phone. Her parents are going to be divorced in three years anyway. Don't say that. Don't say that. That's judgy. That's bad. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. But your priorities for your family need to be Christ-centered and biblically based. And here's the deal. When you fight for those priorities, when you train your children, even from an early age, when you train them, this is what the Bible says about that. When you train up a child in the way he should go. When I start from an early age giving my child priorities, 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 even when they are old, they'll not depart from it. Well, I know somebody, they got drugged to church every Sunday and they're out there living for the devil. I, I, I get there are some of those situations. I understand that. But I'm just telling you, if you'll lean into the promises of God, if you teach your child from an early age how to live a priority-centered life, like be a worship first family. And this is going to happen. I'm just going to tell you, those of us that, that are parenting teenagers and, and adolescent kids, when they turn 22, 23, 24, and you drug them to church every Sunday and they finally get a little bit of freedom, like, I don't have to go to church with mama now. You know what? There's going to be a season they might not. 
There's going to be a season that they might choose that, that they, don't, they don't need to go to church. Okay? But then when you start having grandbabies, when they start kicking those things out, there's just something about kids that cause parents to go, well, you know what? My mom and daddy raised me in church, so we better get these babies here in church. And they're going to bring them here. We're going to get them checked in over there. Miss Pam's going to love on them. And you're going to, mama, she's going to be all stressed out. She gets to come have some Jesus time, and they're going to get it. You know what? My parents weren't so dumb after all. Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. Be a generous family. The last thing you want for your kids is for them to have zero financial responsibility or discipline. If they just live a life that, oh, you need that? Okay, well, you can have that right now. Oh, you didn't save up for it? It's okay. We'll just put it on a credit card. If your kids grow up that way, they're going to live a life that is all about themselves, and then they're going to get married, and you've already created a monster. It is so important that we model this and have conversations with our kids when we're sitting around the dinner table, why we're generous people, why we give, why we serve, why we do what we do as a family. Yes, there will be times that there is wailing and gnashing of teeth, but you just say to your husband, it's okay, we're doing this for the children, right? Y'all are with me, all right. So I say this to my kids all the time. When our priorities, when our wants hit our needs, when they're looking at the world around them, they're playing the comparisons game. I say this to my kids all the time. Listen, having been that way, having chose that way, I'm just going to ask you to trust my 45 years knows more than your 15. And so how do I do this? How do I build a watchtower and watch my kids? Because that's really hard. It's really hard to watch my kids struggle. I want a helicopter in. How do I do this? How do I lead my kids through pain, disappointment, anxiety, adversity? And, and, and then how do I protect them? How do I do the two things I want to give you? Last two blanks I want you to help fill in. Number one is you have to model it. You have to model it. You have to show your children how to deal with pain by how you deal with pain. The right way. The biblical way. You show your kids the right way to deal with tension and conflict, right? Right? I'm going to go talk to the person I need to, not everybody around them. I'm not going to put it on Facebook. I'm going to go to the Word of God. I'm going to do what the Bible tells me to do. So you model this behavior to your children because I'm going to tell you more is caught than taught. Yes, there are times that you need to be bold. There are times you need to defend your family. Absolutely. There are times you need to step into situations with courage because it's the right thing to do, not the emotional thing to do. And then there are times I need the wisdom to be quick to listen and slow to speak because I don't know everything that that person's going through. And there's going to be something about the situation that I may not have all the pieces, so I'm not just going to blow up everybody. And so I'm going to teach my kids how to have a little bit of wisdom because I'm going to show that I have a little bit of wisdom because I want to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And then you're going to teach your kids by showing grace because once upon a time... Like yesterday, I needed grace. One of the best gifts you can give your children is show them how to heal and how to forgive and how to recover, how to get back up in adversity. I know Proverbs says that discipline will root out foolishness. It'll, it'll, it'll drag out immaturity. <laughs> but there is nothing that will make you grow up faster than to see a smaller, miniature version of yourself running around the house, amplifying all of your dark side issues because they act just like you. The only problem is, you're in your 30s, they're four. They're talking like you and that probably ain't a good thing. You know what I'm saying? They're behaving like you. And it looks weird coming out of a four-year-old. Nobody will tell you it looks weird coming out of a 34-year-old. So you need to model priorities. Set at the dinner table. Have conversations. Explain the why we do what we do as a family, why we give, why we forgive, why we serve, why we pray, because more is caught than taught. And then lastly, I'd say this, you need to measure it. You need to measure it. There are some things you do well as a family. There are, you need to leverage that for good. Hey, what do we do good as a family? Let's do more of that. And sometimes I think we so much work on compensating our weaknesses. Yes, there are some weaknesses. We, get, we can't just wash them all. Man, I ain't good at that, so I'm going to quit brushing my teeth. You know, no, no, not, not the right thing. Not the right thing to give up. But sometimes we focus so much attention on, on fixing our weaknesses that, that maybe you need to talk. So what are we good as a family? Let's do more of that. Let's leverage, 
Let's leverage that. And I'm just going to tell you, sometimes we need to make some adjustments. And, and I love you. And, and my fear is by even saying this, that there's some of you that you would use this as an open-ended conversation to go a little bit of Frank Costanza airing of the grievances at Festivus. I got a lot of problems with you people, right? That's not what it's about. And I, I don't want some of you wives to go, oh yeah, let's talk about our kids and our marriage. You know what I'm saying? Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh yes, let's have that, that, that's not this. This is a this is a measuring a healthy conversation. And and I I had this conversation with my daughter this week, driving her to school. I try to ask this question often. What do you need from your dad? Most of the time, it's like I'm good. I'm like, yeah, you are, cause you're my kid. Fist bump it out. <laughs> you know, you good. So I can ask that question 100 times, and 98 times I'll get, no, I'm good. Sometimes it opens up the door for me to step into a place in their life that they're trying to process pain. Sometimes it opens up the door for me to, to step in and use my 45 years to help their 15. Sometimes it, it gives us the opportunity to, to help them unpack life. What, what do you need from your mom? What can I do to help? What, what do you need from your dad? Obviously, if you ask a toddler, they're going to say a snack, right? But as your kids get older, measure it. Have that conversation. Have the, you won't regret it. You won't regret sitting around the table going, hey, what do we do well as a family? Let's do more of that. I want to give you a resource. I'm a podcast listener. I listen to something almost every day. I do a little bit of driving, but even when I'm like exercising or jogging or whatever, I, I like to listen to podcasts. And this one I found a couple of weeks ago. I, in, in the podcast that I listen to kind of are in my world, in church and organizational leadership. I gave you one a couple of weeks ago that was a really intended for pastors. This one is too. It's a guy by the name of Andy Stanley. He's Charles Stanley's son, if you're familiar who Charles is. And Andy pastors a big church out in Atlanta. He's an incredible thinker. But his kids are all grown. And one, they did a two episode podcast where him and his wife Sandra came in and they just talked about their principles of raising their kids. And their life was crazy, busy pastoring a big church, but their kids wanted to do this and do that and be all that. And so I don't know if you're a podcast listener, and I would even say if you have older kids, it might be worth his podcasts are typically about 30 minutes. That one's 20. And so it's it's February and March of this year, and the iTunes store you can or podcast you can go in and just Andy Stanley Leadership Podcast. They'll put, if you have the outline, I'll put a picture of what that looks like on there because I found it very beneficial for me. It actually even opened up some conversations I don't think my wife or kids knew. But just through this podcast, just how can we get better as a family? And so some of you, I just want this to be a resource that would actually help you with your growing kids. This was a topic you asked for. Because parenting's hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it, right? And so parenting's hard. Hey, thanks for watching this sermon on the Hillspring YouTube page. If you enjoyed it, take just a second, hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss a single video. For more information about Hillspring, visit our website at hillspring.tv for times and location. We hope your faith was lifted and your life has been inspired with this message. Thanks again for watching.